and uh, it's my happy function as free market. in the country at it <laughs> and uh, he's, uh, he's South Africa's most referenced economist in 2018 economist of the year um, uh, lots of stuff I, uh, he's done his I think the longest running uh, TV program in South Africa on bait soccer 14 years for those who are not Afrikaans you won't be familiar with it but it's one of the most popular and leading TV <coughs> programs in South Africa breakfast uh, affairs. He has affairs in the morning, that is. Um, and, uh, and he's got a master's degree cum laude in economics and he used to work for the Reserve Bank but accepts no responsibility for what it's done. So, uh, including eroding the value of the rand by 95%. So, uh, there we are. And uh, Davi, please, uh, over to Davi. Give him the appropriate welcome. Okay. And I fasten your seat belts with Davi. You're in for quite a ride. You, you want to check the sound? Is it fine? Is it cool? Happiness with the sound. Donkey Leon, thank you very much for that. Okay, I just want to correct you a few things, Leon, and that is that the rand lost 99 percent of its value the past 40 years. From some date. Yeah, yeah, depending what you're starting there. <laughs> and uh, it's only uh, Derek Watts that's been on TV longer than me. <laughs> and I've made some decide. I've made some changes to my life this year. I've decided to to change a couple of things. I only shower in cold water from now on, which is quite something. I can tell you that's it's summer still, so I don't know how it's gonna. And I've decided never to wear the same college socks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and something else I've decided to do is that um, uh, I, I next year I'm not going to do this presentation again, it, because it's just not fair to you. And it's not fair to my people to do this, um, because I just cannot uh, get it prepared properly in time for this. Um, and there are, and I, you, will see, you will see some spelling mistakes here. I've gone through the presentation myself once, and this is this afternoon. And, um, and uh, so I'm also a little bit unsure exactly what, what I'm going to say tonight. So, um, but I've got a few things. We've started preparing for this, obviously, long before the time, but you have to make the last couple of minutes the necessary adjustments to, to the presentation. So my apologies for all the mistakes, and there are going to be a couple of mistakes in the presentation, but I think the broad message uh, should come through quite clearly. Before I get to just my intro, I want to start my the intro of the intro, and that is just what the main things. So see, there's the first spelling mistake. But the main things in the budget, I think the first thing is that the minister said in the budget that he expect the revenue in the current financial year. Remember, the current financial year only ends the end of March, so we don't know yet what the final numbers in the current financial year are going to be. The, the financial year of the state starts on a very appropriate date, the 1st of April, but in the current <laughs> so that for the current financial year, we still don't have the final numbers. The minister expects state revenue, and again, it really depends. It's like this number, Leon, where do you start when you calculate the, how much the rent has lost? It always depends on where you start, and that's exactly the same with the budget. What do you compare stuff to? So when I say that the revenue, according to the minister, is going to be 64 billion below budget, budgeted estimates, this is the, the compared to the original budgeted estimates. Remember, there's always a revision. So what do you compare stuff to? But anyway, so the minister reckons revenue in the current financial year, the current financial year that ends the end of, of March this year, is going to be about 60 billion rand below the original budgeted estimates. I disagree with him. I think it's going to be at least 70 billion or maybe even as much as 80 billion below the, the his original budgeted estimates. There are a number of reasons for that. Uh, personal income tax, the most important uh, revenue source, that is coming under tremendous pressure. Uh, company taxes has been under pressure for many, many years. And recently we've seen value added taxes also collecting much less than expected. Uh, and value-added tax is uh, an indication of underlying demand in the economy. Company taxes is usually an indicator of the underlying strength on the economy, and that's usually a better indicator of underlying strength in the economy. And that is usually a leading indicator also of underlying strength 
in the economy. But the point is, revenue is under tremendous pressure. And I believe that the Minister of Finance is again overestimating his revenue for the next financial year, which will start the 1st of April and go on until 2021. Debt is getting completely out of hand. Now, <clears throat> I was wrong in many aspects on my predictions on what the Minister of Finance is going to say in this budget. I thought he's going to increase the number of taxes. He is in need of money. He must get money from somewhere. And I thought he's going to increase the number of taxes. He did increase a few taxes, but not really. Uh, and I'll go through that. So if he, he, and he, he needs money. He needs to get money somewhere. So he decided instead of increasing taxes, he is going to do something else. He's going to borrow more money. And that's the reason why debt is completely getting out of hand. So everybody is very happy. No tax increases. But remember, if you don't increase taxes, but you keep on spending money, you are simply postponing tax increases into the future. So there were actually quite significant tax increases because spending just keeps on going up while, um, and he's simply borrowing more money. He, um, the main thing for me, and this is a main thing, a uh, major thing, one of the major things, the minister reckons, so all his estimates includes his expectations of reducing the wage bill by 160 billion rand over the next three years. So if you look at the fiscal deficit and his projections on the debt numbers and so on, that includes his expectations that he's going to be successful in reducing the wage bill by 160 billion rand. Kusato already said they're going to take the war to the streets on this. So I don't know he's going to, whether he will be successful in doing this. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, there's another 60 billion rand that he's going to give to Eskom, and I'm going to come back to Eskom just now, and South African Airways. Now, that's another bailout. Now, I cannot explain this to you. It doesn't make sense to me. We've had 11 bailouts on South African Airways. South African Airways currently is on a, under business rescue. South African Airways has been put under business rescue, not voluntarily, like the Minister of State and Enterprises is saying. He has been forced to put South African Airways under business rescue. Business rescue means something specific, and I think the, the meaning of business rescue, what it means to you and me, and what it means for the Minister of Finance are two completely different things. They continue to bail out South African Airways. I cannot understand that. I just cannot understand it. The deficit in the current financial year, according to the Minister, about 6.8% of GDP. This is very big, people. This is a seriously big number. 6.8 percent the Minister of Finance, my number is slightly bigger, around about 7 percent of GDP in the current financial year. Debt servicing cost, that's interest on state debt, is the fastest growing expenditure item of the Minister of Finance, currently around about 12 percent. of uh, Personal income tax adjustments, personal income tax adjustments, that was another surprise, I must say. The one major surprise was taxes did not increase that much, and personal income taxes was actually adjusted to account for inflation. But like I've said, if you don't pay taxes now, but they keep on borrowing, you're going to pay taxes in the future. They're simply postponing taxes into the future. The Minister of Finance, and this is really good news, mentioned that he's thinking of reducing corporate income taxes over time. Uh, and then he did also mention limiting company interest reduction, and referring to the base erosion and profit shifting and so on. Now, I am an asset manager. I look at people's money. I do certain structures for them, and I, and I manage the, their assets in various portfolios. Now there, and we don't do that, but I've heard what people do, is that they borrow money, say a company borrow money for example, and at the same time take this borrowed money and invest it somewhere else. And deduct the interest of the money that you've borrowed from your income in order to get SARS to partly pay for your investment somewhere else. Now that is illegal, you're not allowed to do that. But they, are, they tell me there are ways of getting around that. So I think the Minister of Finance is going to clamp down on that. I think that's part of that. And of course, you use this to externalize some of your profits, to make, take your money out of the country. Fuel levy increase, a couple of other small tax increases. Um, let me get, before I get to ESCOM, the sovereign wealth fund, we're going to get a sovereign wealth fund. A sovereign wealth fund is something that you establish when you have some sort of surplus. We do not have a surplus. I wonder if there is not a, a story behind the story on the sovereign wealth fund. We actually do have a sovereign wealth fund. The PIC is nothing but a sovereign wealth fund. What if, and we all know that there has been talk about using the PIC or Government Employment Pension Fund's money, use that to fund uh, ESCOM. Um, we, haven't, we, we don't have a conclusion on that yet. We don't know what's going on there yet. But what if we put the PIC in a sovereign wealth fund eventually? And while we're doing that, we can put all the other assets of the state into the sovereign wealth fund as well 
asset in inverted commas, like for example Eskom, and net the whole thing off. So that will be a kind of an indirect way. And by the way, there are approximately 700, 800 billion rands of reserves at the South African Reserve Bank. So while we're at it, why, why, why don't we put that into the sovereign wealth fund as well? I'm concerned about, about that. But anyway, so we're going to start a sovereign wealth fund with some surplus that I don't know where we're going to get that. And then Eskom. We have been waiting. Now, Eskom is in need of about 200, 250 billion rand into, and simply to fix its cash flow. It's impossible for Eskom to keep on with the current debt burden that it's carrying. And again, we did not get, we did get an announcement that 60 billion rand is going to go to Eskom and South African Airways. But that's not nearly enough to fund Eskom, the uh, real requirement of Eskom. Uh, and there's no answer to that. So uh, the, I think it's important for the Minister of Finance to take us in, us in his, his uh, to, to, uh, confidence, to tell us where the money is going to come from. Is he going to borrow money in the financial markets and give it to Eskom? Is he going to make use of the Government Employment Pension Fund or maybe private sector pension funds to give Eskom 200 billion rand? They need 200 billion rand. They just don't answer us in this. And I think that's unfair. The, pres the Minister must tell us where Eskom is going to get this money, because I still don't know where Eskom is going to get to 200 billion rand. So that, in a nutshell, is a couple of things that I just wanted to start off. That's the intro to the intro, and then me, let me get to, to my presentation. I'm just going to touch on one or two things internationally. This is my presentation that I mix a little bit with the minister's presentation as well. The, corona, uh, the uh, coronas, um, uh, coronavirus, um, just one or two things important with the coronavirus. The financial markets, is the f when, there's a, when the bad news was uh, hit the financial markets, there's an ugly bug coming from China. The financial markets reacted negatively to that. So the first round impact on the is on the financial markets, not on the real economy, but on the financial markets. We saw the rand took a bit of a knock on the bond market and equities and so on. So that was the first round effect. Then gradually what happens, they start closing the factories, they start, people start moving around, they stop the trains and stuff like that, and gradually it will have a real economic impact. And then the second round impact, and that's what we saw yesterday in the JSE, is when the financial market saying, but this thing is real. It's going to have an impact on the economy, and you get the second round impact on the financial markets, and what we saw yesterday, and on the economies, on the real economies. And the third round effect, in the case of South Africa, will actually happen when we find the bug in South Africa as well. So what is, how this whole thing is going to pan out, I'm not really sure, but what is very, very clear is that it will have an impact on world economic growth, particularly from countries like, for example, China, and depending how the thing spreads, of course, it can have a, an impact on many other econ economies in the world as well. That's just a comment about Corona. The new nationalism, I mentioned last year that we've got this new form of, of nationalism, and I know that the Democrats, for example, are going out of their way to make sure that Donald Trump is going to be re-elected in the U.S. because it seems as if Bernie Sanders is going to be, at uh, this stage at least, although I think Bloomberg may actually become the, um, the, the Democrat um, candidate for, for the presidency. Uh, but new nationalism is very strong and alive out there. And Donald Trump is currently in India and he and his chum, Narendra no Modi also a typical new nationalist. New nationalism is important because that leads to the isolation of countries, and then the isolation of countries politically means that they isolate themselves polit economically from other countries as well, leading to things like, for example, trade wars and so on. Monetary policy, I believe, with this coronavirus, as well as fiscal policy, I think interest rates will be reduced even further internationally. And I also believe, especially if Trump is re-elected, that he's going to really open the taps and spend a lot of money on the fiscal side uh, in the United States. And not only there, I also believe that the Germans will eventually come to the party as well. So uh, what I'm trying to say, this very loose fiscal and monetary policy internationally is likely to support uh, the, world financial, the world financial markets. I'm actually quite bullish on equity markets. And by the way, I'm relatively bullish about South African equity market as well, especially financial counters and especially the capital market and even the rent and I'll get to the rent just now. Okay, just a few other things and this is the, the ANC. I uh, had some political comments that I would like to make. The, the ANC, uh, if you want to understand why a political party or why a government is making, or make, uh, making certain decisions, ideological decisions and why you have certain policies and so on, you have to understand the ideology and that's exactly what I've done. Uh, I've been looking at the ideology of the ANC and all the other political parties. I've been writing about that. And clearly the ANC was a typical um, 
ideologically driven organization for, for many years, especially up to 1994, the INC was a liberation organization, a left-leaning socialist liberation organization. In 1994, the INC made the complete, they, 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 and they, they converted themselves into a new liberalist kind of party, and, and I'll show you some of the numbers later, where Trevor Manuel started cutting back on state spending, liberalized the financial markets, and so on. So they changed into something else, ideologically. Uh, but gradually things started to change, especially on the Zuma, but it happened before Zuma, cadre deployment and centralization and patronage and state capture and all of that. So the ideology seemed to, 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 seems to be changing. Now, I thought that the ANC was re moving back to its liberation roots, and I think I made a big mistake because it's not mostly today, it is not an ideologically driven organization, it's simply an organization that lives off the state. Now there are, si there are still a couple, of, a couple of ideologues within the, uh, the ANC, like for example Pravin Gordon, um, but, but the rest of them is just there to live off the state. There are major, primarily four power blocks within the ANC, at least the way I see that. You get the president, the Pravin Gordon, they are sort of a power block. Then you get um, Didi, they call him Cat, the deputy president, because he's many, got many lives. Um, <laughs> so the deputy president uh, uh, is, uh, is a hired gun. Nobody trusts the deputy president, but the, rea the reality is, is that if something should happen to the president, he's going to be our next president, and I wouldn't want him to be the president. Uh, the third power block is Ace Magasule, with all the funny things that he does. Um, and he seems to be consolidating his power. And the fourth power block is Tito Mboweni himself. Tito Mboweni, although he is ideologically a socialist, I guess you can call him a socialist, he's a pragmatist at least. And I, that's what we saw in the budget today as well. So that's, ideal, I think it's important to understand that the ANC is not an ideologically driven organization anymore. They simply exist to live off the state. And that will, that's the reason why they will make it impossible for the Minister of Finance to cut back on state spending. Because that's what the ANC does. It lives off the money of the state. And you cannot make the state be smaller because then you're going to undermine the reason for the existence of the ANC itself. All right, then let me give you some, and this of course leads to a lot of uh, uncertainty and confusion and all that. Let me give you a few examples. The Reserve Bank is going to be nationalized. I've got it, we've got it in the ANC letterhead. Nationalize the Reserve Bank and we going to amend its mandate. Some of this was decision decided uh, at NASREC as well. So we know that as a fact it's going to happen, or, but then the Minister of Finance said, no, it's not going to happen, and the President said it's not going to happen. So I really don't know what, what's going to happen to the Reserve Bank. <laughs> the Reserve Bank is important because the Reserve Bank is, like I've mentioned, there's a pot of gold of around 700 billion rand at the Reserve Bank. South African Airways, is it, is it a national asset or is it not? Is it going to be killed or is it not going to be killed? I just don't know. Um, business rescue is an interesting one. Uh, interesting how the Minister of State and Enterprise said that they've, been, they've put South African Airways into um, uh, voluntary business rescue. That is not the case. He was forced to do that uh, by another trade union that applied for business rescue. Eskom, are we going to allow private generation of power or are we not going to do that? And, and again, we don't know. They say one thing and you can hear something else. Private property rights, uh, then they, they, recently they've been saying that the final arbiter basically will be the politicians and not the courts. And prescribed assets or not, I just don't know whether that will happen. Last week, as soon as recent as last week, they mentioned that uh, they are going to use the Government Employment Pension Fund to fund ESCOM as an example. And I guess that's part of the reason why we did not get something concrete from the Minister of Finance in today's budget speech because they're still sort of fighting behind the, the curtains on whether they're going to use the Government Employment Pension Fund to do this or not. I believe that Pravin Gordon should go as Minister of Finance. Here are the reasons why I say so. Uh, if you look at the numbers, I'm going to show you the numbers now. Pravin Gordon was the Minister of Finance when the state, the fiscal account started collapsing. Two reasons. He started, he kept on pumping in billions and billions of rands into the state on enterprises while he was the Minister of Finance. He was also there while the wage bill got completely out of hand. Um, he then became the Minister of State on Enterprises and while he was, for the past two years, while he was the Minister of State on Enterprises, he prevented the restructuring of the State on Enterprises. That's the reason why good guys like Jarana, I believe, 
and uh, Pakanmani Adebe why they decided to leave Eskom and South African Airways because they were prevented to make the necessary adjustment by Pravin Gordon. Um, and then he was forced to put South African Airways into business rescue eventually. He is a communist and I don't think he's got, to, he's got the, the, his hand in the cookie jar, but the, the, con, the, the contradiction here for me is, in a way it's okay to talk to somebody that's a socialist because socialists got, some, got a clever guy behind them called um, uh, Karl Marx, for example, and he's written some stuff and you can debate with people like that. Somebody that simply love, uh, live off the state, you cannot debate with them because they live off the state, it's simple as that. Praveen Gordon believes, he's an ideologue, he believes in his ideology. And he believes that his colleagues believe in his ideology as well. And that's why he keeps on giving South African Airways a second chance, and a second chance, and a second chance. And he simply cannot believe why it doesn't work. It doesn't work because they don't see it the way he sees that. He, they see this as an opportunity to live off the state. He sees that as his responsibility as the Minister of State on Enterprises to make sure it remains the assets of the people so to speak. Um, if you ask me, I believe he should go. If you ask me who should take his place, I don't know. I don't know who should take his place. But I think Praveen Gordon is one of those guys that I think should have gone a long time ago. This is some of the achievements. These are the recent numbers that I've just updated. South Africa, is, South Africa is the green one, comparing to some other countries in the world. I think I've got the world there. I can't see properly. I think I've got the world there and Africa, I think, are the two. And you can clearly see where South Africa is. This is just GDP growth of South Africa recently, and we are doing really horribly. This is GDP per capita, the red one, and I'm going back in 1965, is the emerging economies. South Africa's per capita GDP is the same as the emerging economies. The emerging economies all caught up with us, and this year the emerging economies will surpass South Africa, there's a whole lot of them put together, um, on a per capita GDP basis. This is the number that matter most. Um, this is just fixed investments in South Africa. That's the reason why we're not growing. We're not growing because we are not investing. We're not investing because we don't trust the environment. If you don't trust the environment, you don't invest, and the economy will not grow. Life expectancy, that's the, what we had. That's age primarily, and still our life expectancy is well below that of the emerging economies. At least it's moving in the right direction. Unemployment, need I say more? This is our unemployment levels. This is... This is a time bomb waiting to explode. With economic growth currently running at about half a percent or so, uh, and population growth growing at about 1.5%, one it's easy to understand why unemployment will keep on going up. Okay, this is uh, interest rates. And now, let, before you get to, uh, before you go and jump off ba balconies, let me just say <laughs> something, something good about South Africa, something really good, is that we've got somebody at the South African Reserve Bank with the name of... Um, Lesetje uh, Kanyahu, he's doing a really a brilliant job. He's really, really, really doing an excellent job. Imagine if we had inflation running at 10% under the current sort of circumstances, then we really would have been in very, very deep trouble. The job of a central banker is, a central banker essentially has got two jobs. In the case of South Africa, the central banker has got three jobs. Lesetje Kanyahu's first job, and he's going to be here for the next five years, so hopefully he's going to keep things together. But the first job of Lesetje Kanyagu is to protect the South African Reserve Bank from the onslaught of the politicians. That shouldn't be his job. He shouldn't, that shouldn't be his job. But that's part of his job. I think he's done a sterling job so far, but that, I promise you, will continue over time. The second job of the central banker is to get inflation low. And you get inflation low mechanically by keeping interest rates relatively high. Now he's done that. Inflation is still not low. 4.5% is not low, but at least it's on the lowish side especially giving South Africa's history. So he's done, he's done that, and I think well done to him. Anyway, inflation band is 3 to 6%, the targeted band. The third job of the governor of the central bank, and it's perhaps in a way the most important job, is to get inflation expectations down. And that has been coming down as well. But in order to get inflation down and inflation expectations down, you have to, main, you have to get people to trust you. You have to get people to have confidence in you. And you do that, unfortunately, by playing tough. And that's what he's done. He's been keeping interest rates relatively high in South Africa for some time. Now he's proved his credentials, and now we're in a position where he can start cutting interest rates. So I believe, and, and I also believe, if something starts going wrong, he's going to start rise, raising interest rates, which is the right thing to do. So, and that's, and I believe, and that's where we are, I think we can cut interest rates actually, 
uh, but we should all be very, very thankful that we've got some, somebody like, for example, the Seche Kanyahu there. Just by the way, um, a link to the South African Reserve, but let me sh just show you this. This is my calculations on the exchange rate of the currency of the RAND. Um, the RAND is a very hugely undervalued currency. Traditionally, the RAND is roughly about 50% undervalued based on the way that I calculate that. If somebody wants to know the technical part, I can explain that to you. But my, my calculation says that the RAND should be here. That is roughly about 13-something or so to the US dollar. That's where it is at the moment. So it's more, uh, uh, that means undervalued. This means overvalued based on historic trends. So the RAND's currently a little bit on the weak side. Um, and that's, in a, in a weird way, that's a good thing for South Africa because we have a relatively, a very cheap currency, a very, very cheap currency. We have very attractive yields on the bond market. Our yields of nearly 8% is very attractive. If you want to lend money to the Germans, you have to pay them before they take your money. So that's, a, and, and we pay you 8% if you, give, if you lend money to the South African government and our financial markets are very well regulated and very liquid. That's important. So even if we do get a downgrade, I'm not necessarily sure the RAND's going to take a knock. A foreigner can enter South Africa cheaply via the currency. You can buy into very juicy yields in a very liquid market. So if you want to take a, a quick bite of the apple, South Africa is certainly the place to be. So if, if we get a downgrade, which I believe we're going to get, I don't necessarily think the RAND's going to take a huge knock. Initially it will, but it's probably going to come back because it's, under, it's cheap, very nice yields, and very liquid. And part, part of the reason for that has to do with Lesetia Chakanyahu. Well done, Jim. But that's part of the good news. This is unemployment in South Africa. Now what? And you just look at this number. This is, uh, this is absolutely, absolutely horrible. Main reasons has to do with weak economic growth, labor legislation, of course, labor relations, which is toxic in South Africa, and skills. We've got a serious skills shortage in South Africa. The thing is, when you look at the, the, the composition of the civil servants, what we have, we've got a lot of civil servants, but we've got a shortage, actually, of well-qualified civil with necessary skills. So we have to get rid of the people that are there because we want to create jobs, which is a silly idea, and we have to replace them with people with necessary skills, which we don't have. So that's why we have all these visa requirements and nonsense we should actually get rid of as well. Economic growth in South Africa, here are some estimates. Last year, our estimates for last year is 0.3 of a percent. I'm making the classic mistake, by the way, that all economists are making. All economists. Now, you can look at any institution. Look at the IMF. Look at the South African Reserve Bank. Look at the Minister of Finance today. Look at the World Bank. Look at any economic institution, financial institution, and ask them about economic growth projections going forward. And in all instances, economic growth will go faster over time. That's what I'm saying here. They always tell you, no financial institution will tell you we're going to go into a recession in two years' time, for example. Nobody tells you economic growth is going to remain. So and I'm doing exactly the same. So actually, I tell you, this is an optimistic, typical economist kind of prediction. I think economic growth, let's be realistic, cannot exceed 1% in South Africa, simply because ESCOM is putting a lid on, there's a ceiling of about 1% in terms of economic growth. So I don't say it's going to grow at 1%, that's the ceiling. Anything below that is probably more likely. All right, this is our current account deficit, which is a bit of a problem. We're currently, currently running a current account deficit. The difference between imports and exports of about 3, 3, 4 percent or so to GDP, which is uh, sort of a bit of a contradiction because with very weak economic growth, very weak demand, and demand's getting even weaker in South Africa, imports are supposed to slow down quite significantly as well. But we're still maintaining a current account deficit of 3 odd percent. A current account deficit of, say, 3-4% or so in an environment with 3-4% economic growth is a shop, that's okay, but you cannot maintain a current account deficit of 3-4% while the economy is only growing at 1%. It simply means that you're owing foreigners more and more and more. You're becoming more and more dependent on foreign capital inflows, which indeed is the case. A bit of a summary on some of Treasury's numbers today and some of my numbers for today, economic growth last year, they've got 0.3, I've got 0.3. Economic growth for this year, I've got half a percent. Uh, fiscal deficit um, in the current financial year, which will end now, I've got 7%, they've got 6.8. And next year's fiscal deficit or debt levels, I've got 67% to GDP and 65. I'm going to get back. I'm gonna, I've got some pictures that I can share with you on that. Pictures say much more. All right. That, uh, that dotted line, I have to look at it on the left-hand scale. That's the fiscal deficit. And the right-hand scale are the two, the red line and the, the blue line. 
The red line is the state spending as a percentage of GDP, and the blue line is state revenue as a percentage of GDP. And the gap between the two, of course, is the fiscal deficit, which I express as a percentage of GDP on the left-hand scale. So the point that I'm trying to make here, and the important point is that if you look at the red line, and it starts in 1964, the red line has been going up, and it's been going up, and it's been going up, and it's double where it was in 1964, as an example, and that is state spending. State spending relative to the size of the economy. And politicians, now there's a very important rule and a very important lesson that we have to learn here. Politicians quite often tell us, if we all pay our taxes, we all going to pay less. They lie. If we all pay our taxes, they're going to spend more, I promise you. <laughs> and that's what they've been doing. So state spending as a percentage of GDP has been going up, and it will continue to go up over time. In fact, it's really accelerating in the recent years. Okay, um, just, some, just some other numbers that I would like to share with you. This is just the revenue numbers, the most important revenue items of the Minister of Finance. Personal income taxes, about 40% of total taxes. I'm going to break that down a little bit. The second important one, valid added tax over there. And the third one over there is company taxes over there. And this is the one that we want to reduce, which is good. I was really surprised to hear that from the Minister of Finance. Give him his dues. He wants to cut back on that one, on company taxes. And company taxes is, of course, uh, it's not really, companies are not paying taxes. So what really happens is that, is that companies always shift the total tax down and burden down to individuals. So you can just as well scrap company taxes because you pay company tax anyway. And anyway, if you compare it, our company tax is currently 28%, and the Americans are down at uh, 21%. So we can't, we can't compete with that sort of, we, we need to cut back on company taxes. So I'm very happy to hear that from Tito Mouwini, which I, by the way, like quite a lot as a Minister of Finance. I think it's good. I think without a doubt it's the best that the ANC uh, can offer. All right, there are just some numbers that we've, just random numbers on our, on our, on our, uh, econ on our economic model, and we again believe that state revenue is likely to be less in the coming financial year than what the Minister of Finance, has, um, Finance predicted in his estimates today for the next financial year. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of these sort of numbers, but here are just some, some smallish adjustments on things like, for example, the fuel levy, we saw the, the fuel levy increase and certain other small, smallest tax adjustments and so on, will give you a couple of billion rand extra. Just a point is that if I was the Minister of Finance, there was a 25 cents increase in the fuel levy. If I was the Minister of Finance, I would have increased the fuel levy by much, much more. The fuel levy, there is no such thing as a good tax, but the fuel levy is a less bad tax. So if you want to get more money in, rather increase the fuel levy for various reasons. It's relatively easy to collect. It's very much a broad-based tax. It's an indirect tax, so I would have increased the fuel levy. Here are three major taxes in South Africa. The top one is personal income taxes. That has been going up, and it will continue going up. And I'm going to break that down for you a little bit, a little bit later. So the most important revenues item for the Minister of Finance is personal income taxes, and there are basically 2 million people paying this tax in South Africa. So you've got 2 million people paying that tax, and those other guys leaving South Africa as well. As an asset manager, whenever... Um, somebody, especially certain of our political leaders, say something, the next day I get emails or get telephone calls, people asking me to assist them to take their money out of the country, and that's what I do all the time. And every time I take some money, somebody's money out of the country and they eventually emigrate, we lose one more person of these two million people that pay the bulk of this personal income taxes. So the state is, and that's not the people, by the way, also supporting the ANC mostly. They are well-qualified people, professional people, and, of course, high earners and employers and taxpayers and so on. The second one is uh, value-added tax. That's the red one over there. That's been relatively flat. And the important one for me is company taxes. And the, not because it's been coming down, which is a good thing, but company taxes, like I've said, is an indicator of underlying economic activities, and that has been coming down for a number of years already. So you can actually see it five years ago. Go for, back five years, and you can see the economy is in trouble because company tax collections has been getting under some some pressure as well. And companies, they, I, can, I can tell you, companies structure their tax affairs in such a manner that they pay as little tax as possible. Companies are getting really very yeah, good at structuring the tax affairs. Personal income taxes, this is at the uh, uh, effective tax rate at $100,000. We pay 45% in South Africa. Japan pays more and Austria pays more. Uh, that is totally incorrect. A, an emerging economy like South Africa should be paying less on direct taxes 
like individual personal income taxes and more in some indirect taxes like VAT, for example. So we upside down here, we are of the highest personal income tax payers in the world. By the way, I can just mention that I was thinking about this personal income taxes before the budget and I really thought that the Minister of Finance may decide to in increase personal income taxes. Uh, maybe or even add an additional uh, super income category in order to increase VAT as well. Because you have, to, you have to sell it politically. You have to nail the rich people in order to increase VAT. You're not going to get much more money in by increasing the personal income tax scales, but at least you can use that as an excuse to increase some of the other taxes like VAT, for example. He did not. He rather decided not to increase this. The scales remained unchanged, more or less, and he decided rather to borrow more money. Okay, this is just some of the important numbers. The, these numbers are always a little bit old. This is the most recent numbers I could get. There are, let me just give you the numbers here. There are 1.9 million people. Personal income tax is the most important tax. So that's 16% of total registered personal income tax payers. It's 1.9, let's call it 2 million people, and 2 million people pay 80% of total personal income taxes. This, uh, there are 125,000 individuals that pay a quarter of total personal income taxes. And these are the guys leaving. These are the guys immigrating. Okay, let me give you another number. Corporate taxes. Our corporate taxes in South Africa, again, theoretically, it should be on the low side, corporate taxes. It is relatively high in South Africa. And the Minister of Finance did indicate, which is very good news, that they're going to re reduce corporate taxes. Now, let's see who's doing the payment, paying there are 388 companies, 388 companies that pay more than half a total company taxes. That is, and they're mostly listed companies, the big listed companies. And the platinum guys, of course, they're making a lot of money now. Eniku, hello, is Yoki. Okay, and value added tax, value added tax is one of those taxes, theoretically, it should be relatively high. It's quite low in South Africa. And I would like, and of course all taxes are bad, but I would like to see the minister actually increasing that and reducing, I think, so for example, company taxes. Or something. He did not. Okay, let me see if there's, uh, like I've said, this is the first time I'm going through this. Let's see where the money is going to. State spending numbers. State spending, the most important state expenditure item is over there. That's uh, education over there. And then some other, uh, that's where the most, the bulk of the money is going to. The total amount of money. It's a lot. This is a functional classification of state spending. And this is a number I would like to share with you. Look at the top graph. That is state spending as a percentage of GDP. Currently running at 32%. It goes up to 32% of GDP. This is state spending. Here's your last budget. This is a huge increase in state spending that we're going to see. Another increase in state spending. So the Minister of Finance decided, and remember this includes an expectation of cutting back 160 billion rand on a civil service wage bill. That's if he's successful in doing that. So that's our main issue. The state is just spending too much money. They're just too big and they're spending too much money. Uh, what are our major issues in South Africa? Education. Uh, I think education is a national disaster and some of the other stuff. I've got happiness in there. I think I mentioned it last year as well. Uh, with Professor um, Natalita Greiling of, of the uh, Johannesburg <coughs> University of Johannesburg. We did some, she's, she's an expert, the world expert on happiness. And it's, it's very interesting to see how happiness correlates with things like, for example, rugby or <laughs> the budget and things like that. We are very unhappy in South Africa. But I'll, maybe you can ask her to come and do a presentation here one day about happiness. That's a very good idea. This is, this, is, this is a real science. All right, the most important spending item of the Minister of Finance is um, education. Now, I can show you where we are in terms of education. There are two measurements that we usually, the pills, pills is one, that's on the reading and stuff. TIMS is another one, you can go and Google that, and you can see where South Africa is uh, in, compared to other countries. So, we spend more on education than most countries in the world, and uh, the outcome of our education is not only bad, it is of the worst in the world. Um, there's, a, there's a, something that we need to be concerned about. Currently, we spend about 12, well, 11% or so on, this is not properly updated. We spend about 12% on interest on state debt. We spend on, on, on interest. 
and interest and state debt because of debt levels going up will also will become the more important expense item over time. We have today currently 18 million people. It increased by 78,000 the past year. 18 million people receiving grants from the state. We have 16.7, um, less than 17 million people with jobs in South Africa. We have today more than 20 million people that receive every month a salary or a, a grant from the state. More than 20 million people. There are, there are 16, 17 million people receive, uh, with jobs in South Africa. Two million of them are civil servants. So we've got 15 million people that are basically private sector workers in South Africa and they basically carry the wages of more than 20 million civil servants. Either civil servants or people that are dependent on the state of the income every month. Uh, some special announcements. Now, I've, I, I must tell you, last year I thought that the medium-term budget policy statement that the Minister of Finance is going to tell us where the ESCOM money is going to come from. He did not. He, um, th this 200, 250 billion rand, he just kicked the can down the road. And then the, I thought the President is going to make some sort of announcement in Sonai. He, he did not. So I thought the minister is going to tell us in this budget, he did not. So I don't know what they're going to do with ESCOM. ESCOM simply cannot survive financially. ESCOM needs a lot of money. I don't know where the money is going to come from. The money can, must come from government employment pension fund or the government, the government uh, must go and borrow money, more money in the financial markets and give it to ESCOM. I don't know where the money is going to come from. And I think, it's, I think it, the minister of finance must tell us where the money is going to come from. It doesn't make sense to just simply ignore this matter. You, they gave 16 billion rand. We're talking about billions here. We gave 60 billion rand to Eskom and South African Airways today, but it's not nearly enough to keep um, South African uh, Eskom alive. Okay, uh, let me see what's next. On this. Okay, the first, the deficit and the debt levels. Oh, this is just some debt levels and what I expect the debt levels to be. The debt levels currently is a region of about 65% relative to GDP, but the picture always tells you much better. That's a fiscal deficit. Now, let me make a very important point here. When you look at the fiscal accounts, quite often you get people mentioning the word austerity. That means that the state is restrictive. The fiscal account is restrictive. They spend less money. Now, countries like, for example, I just heard today that in Singapore, during the financial crisis, they reduced the salaries of all civil servants, all civil servants, by 15% overnight. That's austerity. See what happened in Greece when they got into trouble. That's austerity. This is our fiscal deficit in South Africa. The fiscal deficit is between how much money you spend and how much money you're getting in. And as long as you spend more than what you're getting in, you are stimulating the economy. You're pushing more money into the system than what you're taking out of the economy. Of course, your debt levels will go up by this as well. So the state in South Africa is not cutting back on state spending. It's not a restrictive fiscal policy. It's a highly expansionary fiscal policy. And the irony is, if they bring this fiscal deficit down to zero or reduce this, it will actually force the economy into a recession. We've become addicted to state spending, the whole economy. And the moment the Minister of Finance stops spending money, because eventually he must, eventually you reach a level where you cannot borrow more money. And the moment he does that, the economy is going to go into a recession. And, but the sooner you start doing this sort of stuff, the less painful it will become. And the longer you wait, the more painful it is going to become. And this is where we are. We've become addicted to a state that keeps on spending and keeps on spending and keeps on accumulating more and more debt. This is the debt levels in South Africa. And we, I've got pictures of a couple of guys that were there when things started happening. And I did mention, this is Pravin Gordon. I mentioned why I think he should resign as Minister of Finance. There is him. A couple of guys in between. There is him again. Yeah, he was the Minister of State on Enterprises. And so you can see what happened to state debt. Currently, state debt at 65% of, of GDP. This is just, according to the Minister of Finance's estimate of today, debt to GDP ratio, this number will exceed 72% in three years' time. That is with these good assumptions. That excludes ESCOM. If you add ESCOM to that in three years' time, we're going to stand at 85% debt to GDP or so. So everybody is happy about the budget. Because we did not increase taxes. What we decided to do, instead of increasing taxes, to increase the deficit, and by increasing the deficit, we increase debt. So happiness, no tax increases, but all this debt needs to be repaid one day. 
We're living off our overdraft. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so state-owned enterprises. What I wanted to say, so where is the state-owned enterprises going to get the money? I just don't know. The wage bill, is the Minister of Finance going to be successful in cutting back 160 billion rand? I really, really hope so. I really hope so. Uh, the President, I'm afraid to say I'm not... I'm not putting too much money on the president in supporting the Minister of Finance. I really hope the president's going to grow a backbone and he's going to start supporting his Minister of Finance and, and if necessary, do whatever needs to happen to cut the state, the, the, the wage bill. There are just too many civil servants that are getting paid by us. And I must also tell you that I cannot see how we're going to get away from a downgrade this time around. I think they've given us enough time. And then, um, how to fix this mess? I've got, this is exactly the same slide that they have last year. We have a government in South Africa that's failed in just about everything. I, I'm, I'm really thinking hard to find things that actually works. I can find a few things, like for example, the South African Reserve Bank is doing very well. The Setje Kanyaga that was appointed by the government, he's, he's really doing well. Other guys like St Stat South Africa, they're doing a good job, but they're running out of money. They're threatening to, <laughs> to stop making their numbers. So very few things really work in South Africa. I've been, I'm all over South Africa. I go to the small Plattelands and it's, it's really heartbreaking to see what is going on there. It's really, it is so sad to see what's going on there. It is so sad to see what's going on in our education. And I think what we, we don't trust this government anymore. And I can remember there was a time, pers this is a, some personal story of mine, there was a time when I also went through a personal crisis and I couldn't do anything right. And uh, what got me out of it was to just to be successful in something. And I started reading books. And that made me feel good. If I can just do something well, even if it's only reading a book, completing a book, successfully doing a book, reading a book. And I think perhaps that's where we need to start. Get the government to do simple, stupid, just something small, but just do something well. And something that everybody will support them. And I've, this is what I had on the slide last year as well. And I think a good place to start was, will be on road safety. Just go, everybody's going to support that. Just get, just fix, do something well. It's a broken window thing. Road safety. In Rwanda, what they do, I think once a month, they go and they pick up all the litter. Just get the place clean. Everybody will support that. Just do something simple to get this economy to work again. Because as it is at the moment, I'm afraid. It's a bit of a disaster. Okay, that's my presentation on the budget. Um, I'm very sorry that about some of the spelling mistakes, uh, but uh, I promise next time I'll try to make, go through it before the time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tavi. I think you'll forgive your spelling mistakes. <laughs> it's a small fry. Um, thank you. We now have questions. I'm Dan Bocchieri, Head of Communications for the Free Market Foundation, and Davi is able to answer questions, yes. so we'll take three, and then we'll start some more. If you please say your name, and if you're an individual or from an organization. Okay, I think there's one there. Sorry, I must start with my with, friend. With Ian. <laughs> <laughs> he complains that I never give him a chance, <laughs> so it's Ian, it's you, and then Anthony. Ian Crookshank, to the rest of the Darby, uh, you mentioned a bit uh, yes, sir. tax rate at Country. Yeah. Country. Country. I will repeat the question. I will repeat the question. Okay. <coughs> and VAT 26 percent or vice versa. So the two together came to 45. So that in fact is our personal tax rate. How does that compare with the rest of the world? It sounds heck of a lot. Okay, the question is, let me just see if I understand this. So, personal income tax plus, plus VAT. That is, that is personal tax. That's personal taxes, yes. How does that do together? Quite high. Yes. The question, this is an interesting question, what, what, what Ian is doing here, he's trying to calculate personal taxes. And personal taxes, uh, and your personal taxes are personal income taxes and VAT. Those are the two that you put together. Which is completely, totally right, because that is personal in a way, because you either take it from the money that I earn or you take it from money that I spend. So it's pretty much personal. And our personal tax marginal rate is 60% actually in South Africa. Because that plus, plus you 45%. So how do you compare that to the rest of the world? And it's actually very, very high. 
because um, VAT is not as high. our personal income taxes is very very high, and our VAT is more or less in the middle of the uh, of the group, making us relatively high, quite high actually. I wouldn't be surprised if we are of the highs, if not the highs, for personal taxes in in terms of your definition of personal taxes. But having said that, you know, actually all taxes are personal taxes. All taxes are always paid by individuals. There is no such thing as an, a tax paid by a company. Company will also shift the tax burden down to you. All import taxes are personal taxes in the end. And all taxes are always personal taxes. And if you look at the personal ta or if you look at taxes in South Africa, we're not necessarily that highly taxed in South Africa. Many countries are higher taxed than South Africa. But if you look at the composition of the taxes in South Africa, personal income taxes, company taxes, and some of the other taxes and so on, you will find South Africa's redistribution effect. Now, remember, the fiscus is not only about taxes, where they get the money, but where the money goes to as well. And that redistribution attack, the guys paying it and the guys getting it are two completely different groups of people. It is the most redistributive system in the world. And that makes it worse. Much worse. Because the guys that are doing the payment of the taxes are also guys that are doing the saving in the economy. And if you take all their money away through taxes, they very much little, much less, less, less to save. They will invest less, less in, uh, investment, less economic growth, and everything that goes with that. But in the end, individuals actually pay all taxes. May I ask a question, of course, I'm always scared of you. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> In accounting, in analysis, you look at the most basic fundamental we want to check is the source and application of funds. We are unsure of, if you can see where the source is, you've just been telling us where something comes from, in that application. Do you see any change at all in the belief that the funds are being responsibly deployed? Yes. Because this is our problem, yeah. if you think, we're going to run out of trust. And if that carries on, then that half percent growth rate or one percent is going to be a higher loss. Yes, I mean the, uh, the question basically is can... Is there any hope that we can expect this, the state to become more efficient and can start spending our money better? And I must tell you, and again a credit to Minister of Finance, Tito Mbuweni, that he's put a lot of emphasis on that today. And he's been tweeting all sort of stuff late at night and he's been saying all sort of stuff and he got into trouble with his boss and that sort of stuff. That, but without a doubt. That is where the emphasis was in his speech today. That we don't need, the speech was, I mean, it was a very short speech. Uh, and the last year was also very short. And I like that of the Minister of Finance. But, that, but certainly, if, if it, and I would like him to, be, to remain as Minister of Finance. I don't think he is going to. And I would, wouldn't mind if he becomes the president. Because he understands that. He understands that you have to take the money from the, from the and it's not really how much you pay. It's more of a matter of what you're getting back. And we're not getting really the bang back for a buck, the way that we should be. But they, that's where the emphasis was. Whether he's going to be successful, that is a, 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 a completely different question. Okay. Uh, now, Jonathan, would you say anything Yeah, um, I'm from Martin Lowe. I'm a councillor in the city of Johannesburg. Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you, uh, Darby. I'd like to ask you a question which is not necessarily or directly related to the budget, but um, ultimately is related to our finances. And it's with regards to education, and it's a question um, I ask at every opportunity when I meet an economist, um, and it's namely, with the unemployment rates expanded in, 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 in the expanded version at almost 40%, and with 18 million people, um, um, which has increased from what, what, what it was 70 million a while ago, and on top of that with a, a decreasing or diminishing tax base, what did we do in this country to solve the question of unemployment? Um, um, and if you've maybe got a short version and, and, and a long-term version, I'd be very interested in hearing that. But can we solve it? And what would you suggest we did in terms of not having people unemployed, having them working so we didn't have them on, on the dole, for want of better words? Thanks. Sure. OK, um, I think there are two answers to that. OK, I think there are two answers to that. And I think there's a pull and a push answer to that. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, first of all, of course, you have to create an environment that's good for economic growth. And I can give you a long list of things, what is important, and we all know what it is. Uh, efficient administration, we need low taxes, we need sort of good visas, we, and that sort of stuff. So you have to create an environment, and people got to trust you, and you cannot threaten to steal people's property. You just cannot do that. That's the sort of stuff that you need to do. 
So, but I believe in the longer term, the only way that we can get this economy to grow is that we have to fix education, not education, skills development. There's a big difference. So you have to fix skills development. And that's the difficult part to do. Uh, because you can, uh, skills development, it's not getting people to have PhDs in chemistry. Skills development starts at grade one. And that's the important part. And unfortunately, because the grade ones don't walk, walk in the street and don't mess the place up, they don't get all the attention. But it's the university students that do that that get all the attention. Now, not that I'm saying university students are not important. Of course, we need that. But it's far, far more important to have a good primary education system than to have a good uh, tertiary education system. That is important as well. But that's when we need to start. Unfortunately, that's going to take us 20, 30 years to get that established. You didn't mention the, the uh, state bank. And, uh, oh, yes. What is the Talk logic about. behind wanting to start a state bank? Yeah, state bank, I should have mentioned that. The state bank, good question. I haven't got a clue. I just don't know. Uh, they want to start a state bank. There are already a number of, of state banks. Uh, uh, this, this, this state, state bank is going to be this state bank is going to be a commercial bank. The way I understand it, it's going to offer loans to the normal man on the street and savings accounts and stuff like that. That is the, the I, I just I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I cannot see why the state wants to get involved in another state bank. I, I don't have an answer. I in fact did him when he I, and I, again I, I I like him quite a lot. But he he mentioned this I think a year or so ago already. So, uh, and the president mentioned it now again. I, I can't tell you what the reason is for a statement. I, I just, I, and there are many uh, levels why I say so. There are a number, there are guys like Time Bank and Zero Bank, New Banks, Capitec Bank, for example, and they really, that's their target market, the, the unbanked. And they're really, really successful. How are you going to compete with those guys and do it successfully? I, I, I don't have an answer for that. And it's happening at a time when banking is going to change dramatically. I believe that we in a, at the beginning of a dramatic change in, the, in payment systems and all that. You don't want to go and be in that space unless you're really good, unless you're an entrepreneur, a young guy that understands technology and that sort of stuff. Then it's amazing to be there. But politicians, simply that's not their sandpit. They can't go there. I don't have an answer. I don't know why. Thank you, Davi. My name is Lipa Malvani. I just want you to share with us just one country that you admire that if South Africa was to benchmark itself against it, mm. it could actually get out of this quagmire. I wanted to, I wanted to mention that. But closer to, to, closer to home, there are many other there are many countries that have Just one. Rwanda. Rwanda, there you have it. Although I use a bit of a dictator, I must add. <laughs> and I'm not suggesting we should go there. But th that's it. That's one. I can get, mention South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Ethiopia even. There are many other countries. But uh, close by Rwanda. Let's just clean the place up. Let's try that. Um, one thing you also didn't really touch on uh, was the NHI. I was just wondering. Oh, good. I forgot. I don't have a specific talk. question for you. Just the NHI. Yes, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for a number of reasons. The one is that we don't have the money for that. Um, the second reason is that um, the civil servants, and there are many of them, they are basically making use of the private sector health services, this GEMS. It's part of the, so they pass it basically making use, and they're not going to like that. Kusatu is, and that's Kusatu basically. So they, gonna, they will realize one day, but whoa, there's something, you know, we thought it's going to be a good idea, but it doesn't. It's not, so they're going to prevent that. And the third, and I guess the most important reason, that they, there's something good about having an incompetent government, and is that is that they also cannot implement a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't think it's going to happen. They're going to try, but it's not going to happen. In the 1700s, an economist Thomas Malthus, and uh, if I can remember correctly, he said that he looked at population growth and the growth in agricultural <coughs> production. He said that population is, is rising too fast and England would effectively starve. But what he didn't take into account was te technology, right? It obviously, increased the efficiency of production. Uh, if we look at 
uh, the, the pure theoretical uh, sort of heading to a cliff that we see here now. Uh, do you think there's a scenario with the decentralized finance and advancement in, in monies um, that we see in the world uh, sort of coming over the top like Netflix and the guys have done with telecoms that effectively would mitigate the effect of the state on the individual or would it alleviate the, the sort of the, the pressures of the state on business okay. case? Uh, one day I can remember one day in my office that they, uh, uh, two guys walked into my office about this, something that they wanted to talk to me about and their names were, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give it 100% it is, but basically their names were Frederick, Frederick in Bastiat. Now I don't know who knows Frederick Bastiat. It's a French economist of the 1700s and so on. And that's, those are the two brothers, Frederick and Bastiat. And his father, their, their father, was a great uh, admirer of Frederick Bastiat. And he called his sons, Frederick and Bastiat. And as other die. Can you believe that? And they're involved in a very interesting business today. All right, coming back to you, I was, I was just amazed to hear Frederick Bastiat. The one's called Dale, but your real name should be Frederick. Or, I think, or. Um, so what's the answer to your question? And I think the answer, there are two answers to that. The first one is that, uh, that's a, it's, a, it's a demographic answer to that. What you find in the world is that people get richer and richer and richer. You find it in all most societies, not in all societies, but there are very good reasons why that doesn't happen. So people get richer and richer and richer, and then they reach a certain life expectancy, and that's between 75 and 85, and then suddenly the population starts grow negative growth. So the, the, the pattern is typically you start getting richer, and then you start getting fewer with a few exceptions. Japan is a classical example. China is also heading for that, but they're going to start, population growth will go negative before uh, they, they are rich because, uh, because of things like, for example, the one-child policy and the Russians pretty much as well. So that's one thing that we need to understand. The second thing that we need to understand, and I need to get my head around this, but I can tell you here's a Nobel Prize in, in, in economics, and that is about what is this thing that we call the economy. Because if you look at, uh, for example, the Americans. Now, here's what they taught me at university. When unemployment levels is low, inflation is high, and vice versa. If you look at the American economy, unemployment currently at record low levels, inflation at record low levels, but state debt levels at record high levels, and interest rates at very low levels. This doesn't make sense. What is wrong? What is wrong in this picture? And I'm not sure, but I've got a suspicion what is wrong in this picture is the kind of stuff in which you guys are involved in. And that is especially what is happening in the tertiary industry, especially in the tech industry, the gig economy, what is happening, the internet stuff, what is happening with Microsoft and what is it? Google. Let me give you an example on Google. So what is Google worth? What, the, what does it cost you to Google? Nothing. You can Google. It costs you nothing. It's not included in GDP because it costs you nothing. So you ask people, but you ask people, what will they pay? What will they pay so not to lose Google? There's been some research on this. And people are prepared to pay in the United States $500 a year to have Google. So it's not included in the GDP. So the point I'm trying to make, I've got a suspicion that economic activity, underlying economic activity, if you include all these sort of things, is much bigger and much stronger and population growth much more important than what we think. And if that is the case, then debt to GDP is not really relevant. Then maybe 120% debt to GDP of the Americans is actually 30, 30 or 40 or 50%, something like that. And then the picture makes sense. So I think that is part of the answer, is that perhaps economic growth worldwide, and including in South Africa, is stronger than what we think. And perhaps that's a good sort of positive end, positive note. Any other? And then Dave. Um, I'm best if I'm the second brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, just on the back of your sole comments, that they're doing a good job, um, I was wondering if you know what the, country, the growth in the money, money supply actually is, and how that actually compares to the CPI inflation, just to juxtapose the two. And then a more ideological uh, question on the back of that, what do you think of the actual price controls that's 
they're effectively controlling or setting the price of money, which is the inflation. Oh, that's a long see. Well, I mean, no, this is not going to end. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> This, this is not going to end. Okay, what do I think? Money supply currently in the region of about 6% or so. Uh, the nominal economic growth in South Africa currently roughly about s the same there. Um, uh, now, if you want to ask me as, a, as a, uh, an economist that was trained by a South African e a, a university, the way that most economists are trained in South Africa, then things are more or less in line where things should be. Uh, if you ask me as a bit of a, an anarchist, then I'm going to tell you that I think that the central bank should not be in charge of money, and the central bank should also not set the price of money. should leave that to the market as well. But that's, like I've said, now you're going to really open a big tin of worms if we start debating about that. But currently money supply is roughly about 6%, which is roughly in line with GDP growth, which means the thing is more or less. That means interest rates are more or less correctly priced. Yeah. Thank you so much for your... Yeah, thanks so much for your, for your talk. Um, I'm, I'm from London, I just from the FMFA. I guess my question is around the interest rates, because you mentioned earlier that you think uh, this Kanyako guy has been doing a great job, and now he, he has a room to cut the rates. Yes. And I've been speaking to a few economists, and they think that at this point in time, the sub has to cut the rates because of inflation and the control and so on. So my question is, do you see them cutting the rates this year, especially in the first half of, Twice. of this year? Interesting thing about you know economists they are. I've, I'm 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 I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna make a, a sticker. I'm gonna put it at the back of my car. And I'm gonna say, economist yet human. I think that's a that's a nice. <laughs> now economists are humans. I don't know if you've noticed, but economists are also human as well. Now the interesting thing, economists have got very they've got very big seriously big egos. And last time around, very few economists predicted that the Reserve Bank is going to cut interest rates. Very most economists. Predicted. Don't ask me what I said. I thought they're going to cut, which they did. So I have to say that because I've got an ego as well. But most economists uh, really criticized the Reserve Bank because the Reserve Bank did not cut interest rates. And, and that's the reason. They criticized the Reserve Bank because they were wrong. And I've been wrong many times before as well. So I think you keep that in mind. Keep that in the back of your mind. But if, actually, if you read to the, uh, at the previous Monetary Policy Committee meeting of the Reserve Bank, uh, I think two of the five voted in favor of a rate cut, so you only need one guy, and there would have been a rate cut anyway. So, so I think they simply had it wrong. Yeah, so e economists are criticizing the Reserve Bank sometimes for personal reasons, because they were wrong on their estimates, uh, but I think if you look at what is really going on at the moment in the economy, inflationary pressures are not really that elevated at the moment. In, in fact, inflation could be, fall, could be falling soon, with oil prices coming down and so on, and I really believe there's some room to uh, cut interest rates. Having said that, please never ever look at the Reserve Bank to boost economic growth. That's not their job. Don't use interest rates to boost demand, to boost economic growth. That's not their job. Their job is to look at the, addiction, the, the value of the currency. That's it. And it doesn't matter where the economy is. And fortunately, I think Lasetja uh, Kanyahu has got that balance more or less right. But if you, uh, from an ideological point, I guess there's a lot of things that you can say against the Reserve Bank. But from a conventional economic point of view, they're doing a really a good job. Dave? Uh, speaking, Dave Nichols, speaking as an ex escom whatever. Um, you mentioned ESCOM as being a big credit <laughs> issue. I, my comment, my, it's almost a comment asking you for a response to it. But the power cut costs in this country are actually quite low by world standards. The what? Power costs in this world are quite low by world standards. Okay. The tariff has been suppressed because of apparent belief in whatever you want to penalize ESCOM, although ESCOM is the state, so that works. Um, I've got a comment which says the only way to save the ESCOM situation is allow the tariff to rise to a reasonable level. Yes. And as such, the ESCOM problem goes off your list there completely. Yes. Because they can raise the money to cover their, their costs. Just a comment on that, because the moment yes. nurse is saying no to everything, yeah. which means ESCOM's running yes. the situation. I'll, I'll put it in context so you don't believe yes. it. If ESCOM did not pay its staff one cent this year, they would still not meet their debt with obligations. So the yes. idea that ESCOM's staff costs or something is a problem, no. But Dupi Casilio about the same cost as a world price for the same power station. Isn't a great success, but we can do better. Do you agree that? The nurse impact is fundamental to this process, yes. that if they allow the tariff to rise, would be 
able to put ESCOM off the critical list and resolve the problem of terms of ESCOM. Okay, the, okay that's an ESCOM question. And I, really, I can't answer your question, but I've, as an economist, I've got a, the following comment to make. And um, I don't understand ESCOM that well. I did go through the financial statements. I know it's totally unsustainable financially. I know they need money. And I know that uh, there are many people working there that are very well paid, but again, that's not the answer to that. They need a capital injection. They need cash. That's it. The only way. That's the only way you can save ESCOM. But this is my comment on, on ESCOM, is that you get ESCOM, and they've got a, a bunch of economists, and I can tell you, if you put a lot of economists in the room, you get all sort of funny ideas. But they've got a lot of economists and analysts and all sort of clever people, and they calculate stuff, because they need to go and present something to NERSA to convince NERSA to give them X percent increase. Now, that means they have to make all sort of calculations on the exchange rate, they have to make all co calculations on interest rates, uh, on oil price, or energy prices, on a on just about everything. They have to put all these numbers into a machine and economic models, and then the number pops out and says, so listen, we're going to need X percent increase in electricity in order to achieve A, B, and C. Then they go to NERSA, and NERSA does exactly the same. They also have a bunch of economists. They're supposed to have that. <laughs> and, they, and they do these sort of calculations, they come to an answer as well. The point I'm trying to make here, yeah, and it doesn't matter whether you're NERSA or whether you're ESCOM, nobody knows what the right price of electricity is. And it doesn't matter how many, how many economies you put into a room and how many number crunching you do. You don't know what is the right price of electricity. You just don't know. Nobody knows. And the only way that you can get to the right price of the electricity is completely liberalize the market and let the market set the price. That's what I believe should happen. Because we don't know. Um, Darby, uh, interesting, Dave, talking from an ESCOM or a previous ESCOM viewpoint. How much of the money that ESCOM is looking for is going to go to establishing new power stations for the future? Yes. And not just enough to keep the present ones ready? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, so <coughs> that's actually a bit of a technical question. So, the outstanding debt of ESCOM at the moment is we don't know because we're waiting for the finals, we're waiting for financial statements but it's probably around about 500 billion rand. Uh, they pay 70, 80 billion rand annually that they pay an interest on, on that, only that. So um, that's just not way, there's no way that they can carry this debt burden. So if you give ESCOM money and you give them 100 billion rand, what are they going to do? Are they going to make use this money and build a new power station? And the answer is no, because the debt burden will still be there. So they have to, they have to look after the debt burden. If I was, I don't know how to fix ESCOM, but this is what I probably would have done. I would have taken ESCOM and I would have taken all the debt of ESCOM and put it on the balance sheet of the state. That will lead to a downgrade straight away. And then you start fresh from ESCOM. You start from scratch from ESCOM. You say, listen, I'm going to do whatever, depending on the different divisions, how you're going to approach that. And it, de it depends. Like, for example, the transmission part, I will keep that in, the, in state control. And the other parts, I will sell off and get private sector participation. But that's the reality. It's the debt burden. They've got two issues there. And I'm, I'm, I think you can probably help us better out than that. The ESCOM has got an operational issue, how to get to make electricity. The other one is a financial issue. Those are two different issues. They just don't have enough money. And of course, they don't make enough electricity, as we know. Could you just elaborate on your outlook for equities? You said it would be oh, perfect. Yes. Equities. <coughs> um, uh, the equi South African financial markets are really, the, the, the JSC is really, I mean, it's, I, I know because my clients complain about that all the time. The, the JSC has not been doing well for a number of years now. The JSC is quite cheap at the moment. And, uh, and I also did mention that I like the bond market especially because of the very juicy yields that we can potentially get. And there are a few instruments that usually run in tandem, like for example bonds, the exchange rate and financial shares. It's pretty much the same sort of thing. The driving forces behind them are pretty much the same. So if I want to pick uh, equities or set a, a, a asset class, I would go for the financial kind of things, like for example the banks and the insurers, I like them. Um, in the tertiary sector, typically, but there are a bunch of guys that I do not like. I don't want to touch retailers. I don't want to touch the retailers because the underlying demand in the economy is quite weak and also because of technology, technological reasons. People buying on take a lot. They don't go to the shops anymore. So that's technological changes taking place. 
And then if you go to the, the secondary sectors, I'm not going to buy into manufacturing for a number of reasons. So I'm not going to go there. And I might go if you go into the primary sectors, but this is a bit of a punt, going into some of the very expensive uh, platinum group sort of stuff. They're making a lot of money at the moment. But I believe that is only cyclical. So, but yeah, I would go for the, the financial kind of stuff. That is what I probably like. But keep your finger on the trigger. Remember, we've got, you've probably got about, in South Africa, 40 shares that you can invest in. Uh, probably less, 10 probably, that you can invest in. We invest internationally and there are many, many thousands of them. So merely, purely from that point of view, it makes sense to make sure that you've got a substantial portion of your portfolio invested abroad because they're just more to pick from. So one final question. Who was it? Oh, yes, this one. So I just want to ask your views on, on how to address the, the skills problem and so on. Um, if we have a look at the, our country at the moment, there are a lot of people that have got jobs, but they're not skilled. Um, and I'll give you two examples. Um, you have ten painters, they won't paint out the toilet as quickly as one guy. You can describe nine of them and put them on the dole or whatever. If we go closer to home as far as uh, revenue collections and stuff is concerned, you mentioned you've got two million personal uh, individual taxpayers. But if you have a look at the number of case number, tax case numbers that have been issued, roughly, it's 30 million a year. <coughs> so that means on average, each taxpayer has got 15 crisis questions that are you know, cases that's got to be handled by, uh, by SARS. Yes, there's a couple of bad cases and uh, customs and so on, but that's the average. Uh, now what I'm basically saying is it's if SARS get rid of 50% plus of their staff, get those that are properly trained and, 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 and have a proper background to the tax situations, the, the, the throughput and time wasted on solving tax uh, uh, queries and so on will be far quicker. And surely this you can apply in many other fields as well. Now, if we jump back, uh, right in the beginning you said, uh, you would like to see our president to get some backbone and uh, takes it. Now, I go back to the days of Margaret Thatcher that uh, sorted yeah. out the unions in the UK. I don't know how she did it, but she definitely had a backbone. Um, and the question that I have in this regard is, is, you don't have to be a dictator, but if you take a view, is Ramaphosa's <coughs> position so weak that you can't actually yeah. say something dictatorial and say, this is how we're going to do it. That's the decision. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. OK, that's a, so, well, maybe just a final comment. Before I get, let me just make a comment about SARS, what I, I will fix SARS. Yes, we've got a skills issue on many levels in South Africa, but particularly on SARS, what I will do, instead of, instead of getting very, very highly qualified, competent and very skilled people, of course you need competent people in SARS, because it is a complicated business, uh, in order to fix SARS, what I would have done, I would rather fix the tax system and make it simpler. And you can make the tax system seriously, seriously simple. And, uh, and I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've done a lot of stuff on that. We can simplify the tax system, and you don't need those highly skilled people to work at SARS. And then the last comment, you made a comment about the president. Uh, we are very, very, very deep trouble in South Africa. And I don't believe we've got an economic issue in South Africa. I believe it's, it's political. And what I think what we need is a president to stand up and say, people, we are in trouble here. I've listened to many people. I have a vision. I want us to get there. But I promise you, it's going to be tough to get there. But if you follow me, and we do what, needs to, do what we need to do, and we go through this, through these difficult times, things will start getting better. I want him to tell us that. He doesn't. 